Welcome, Highbury friends and uh, congregation. We gather together on Monday, Thursday. And as we do, we turn to John's Gospel, chapter 13. It was before the Passover festival and Jesus knew that his hour had come and that he must leave this world and go to the Father. He had always loved his own who were in the world, and he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the mind of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. During supper, Jesus, well aware that the Father had entrusted everything to him, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from the supper table, took off his outer garment, and, taking a towel, tied it round him. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel. When he came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, You, Lord, washing my feet? Jesus replied, You do not understand now what I am doing, but one day you will. Peter said, I will never let you wash my feet. If I do not wash you, Jesus replied, You have no part with me. Then, Lord, said Simon Peter, not my feet only, wash my hands and head as well. Jesus said to him, anyone who has bathed needs no further washing. He is clean all over, and you are clean, though not every one of you. He added the words, not every one of you, because he knew who was going to betray him. After washing their feet, he put on his garment and sat down again. Do you understand what I have done for you? he asked. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so. For that is what I am. Then if I, your teacher and Lord, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. I have set you an example. You are to do as I have done for you. In very truth, I tell you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor a messenger than the one who sent him. If you know this, happy are you if you act upon it. It is a vivid memory filled with stark emotion. I was a very young child, probably before I'd begun going to school. It was a Sunday school picnic and the races were about to begin and I was required to take my shoes and socks off and something within me rebelled against the very idea of having to show my naked feet. Now, presumably, the reason we had to take our shoes and socks off was, first of all, the shoes, so that we wouldn't hurt uh, others that we were running with, just in case we tread on their toes, take off the socks, keep our socks clean, perhaps. But to take off my shoes and socks? No! And I remember the feelings of humiliation and embarrassment and the simple refusal. No, I will not. And then it washed over me and I began to cry and had to be gathered up into my mother's arms. The humiliation was utterly complete. Jesus comes to Peter. 
I don't know about, and he wants to wash his feet, but I don't know about any of you, if you've ever had that experience of going into the hospital and perhaps you pay attention to your hygiene. You don't want anyone to find any dirt under your toenails, any soil in the cracks and crevices of your body. You don't want to be exposed. You take off your shoes and your socks. What do we see there? The bunions, the calluses, the twisted toenails, perhaps blackened or thick. The next worst thing to being naked is to show our feet. To be touched on our feet. Perhaps it will be painful, perhaps it will tickle. People will see what we so often hide. And the disciples have been sharing supper with Jesus. They have had a long day. Their feet are caked with dust, mixed with sweat. And Jesus takes off his outer garment takes a towel, wraps it round his waist. This Jesus is giving his life. He is taking off his life in service to all of us. He is going to the cross to give himself for us. This Jesus stoops. He becomes naked and he performs a task that not even the lowest Jewish slave was asked to perform. And here he is, rabbi, teacher, lord, master, washing the feet of his disciples. And he comes to Peter and Peter says, no, you will never wash my feet. Never. If I do not wash your feet, Jesus says, you can have no part in me. And then, of course, Peter goes, swings in the other direction from no to yes and not just my feet, but the whole of me. Today is a day when we come to the place where we have supper with Jesus and we're exposed and vulnerable. And he comes to us to wash our feet, to bring cleansing, forgiveness. But God could never forgive me. God could never love me. Jesus comes as master and he inverts the order of things. He demonstrates that his world, his kingdom, is not the kind of kingdom that we're used to. That his kings and presidents and prime ministers and the way that everything is at the moment with its class system, those who will die without anyone remembering them or knowing that they've died, and those who are ill, who are remembered and prayed for and cared for, and we all hold our breaths baited with hope. This Jesus comes to us and he turns the world on top of its head and serves us, dies for us, is crucified for us. This hymn has come to me. It's by Fred Pratt Green. It will probably never become a well-known hymn sung like Amazing Grace, but somehow it expresses the uncertainty of our times and the invitation that we have to God's love in the crucified Christ. You may find the words of the hymn quite challenging 
but I ask you just to listen and to listen again and to let them speak to you. When our confidence is shaken in beliefs we thought secure, when the spirit in its sickness seeks but cannot find a cure, God is active in the tensions of a faith not yet mature. Solar systems void of meaning freeze the spirit into stone. Always our researches lead us to the ultimate unknown. Faith must die or come full circle to its source in God alone. In the discipline of praying, when it's hardest to believe, in the drudgery of caring, when it's not enough to grieve, faith maturing learns acceptance of the insights we receive. God is love and thus redeems us in the Christ we crucify. This is God's eternal answer to the world's eternal why. May we, in this faith maturing, be content to live and die. Today is the anniversary of Dietrich Bonhoeffer's death, of his execution, days before the end of the war. And so I think it's appropriate for me to come back to him in this world which is so confusing, where the world is being turned upside down, where Jesus stoops and kneels and gives his life and offers to wash our feet and we are repelled by it all. Bonhoeffer challenges us to that moment when what happens when we've even found the answers to the ultimate questions without God. And he invites us to that place, to go beyond the kind of Christianity that makes an argument for God, who is the solution to all of our problems, who is the answer to the ultimate questions. He says, Christian apologetic on the adulthood of the world is pointless because it seems to me like an attempt to put a grown-up man back into adolescence, to make him depend on things on which he is in fact no longer dependent, and thrusting him into problems that are in fact no longer problems to him. Ignoble because it amounts to an attempt to exploit man's weakness for purposes that are alien to him and to which he has not freely assented. Unchristian because it confuses Christ with one particular stage in man's religiousness with human law. The world's coming of age is no longer an occasion for polemics and apologetics but is now really better understood than it understands itself, namely on the basis of the gospel and in the light of Christ. O oh Lord, wash my feet. Take me into yourself. Take me to the place of the crucified Christ. God, your love is certain and sure made plain in your humility in Jesus Christ. We come to you with all of our answers and our questions, our faith and our doubts. And we pray that you would take us beyond superstitious religiosity to the place of complete trust in your love. We are exposed, we are vulnerable. We do not understand your ways, but we pray that you would take us to the cross. 
that we may see in the look of Christ's eyes your love, your heart, your care. We pray these things in your name. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.